Colossians chapter 4. On Sunday mornings we've been going through this book of Colossians. And uh, I've really enjoyed it myself. Amen. Uh, the study and the uh, messages have been a help to me. Praise the Lord. Preachers get helped in the study before they try to help you in the pulpit. Praise the Lord. And uh, we get help from the Word of God. We need it just like uh, everybody else needs it. And so we've come to the fourth chapter, and I preached a message on verse 1 uh, last week, and we'll begin in verse 2. So if you stand together, if you're able to stand, if you need to remain seated, that's fine. It's going to be a couple verses here in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. Notice the Bible says, continue in prayer Amen. and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance Amen. to speak the mystery of Christ Amen. for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day, yes. the opportunity to come here and gather together in your name. We're grateful for your word. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we recognize this morning that we are a needy people. Yes. Lord, I need Thee to preach Thy Word. So I ask You to please fill me afresh and anew with Thy Spirit. I pray that Your Word would go forth with clarity and with force and power today. And I do pray that all would receive it as it is in truth, not the words of men, but the Word of God. We do ask if someone's here today that is lost without Christ, that today they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then for those of us that know You, please work in our hearts in this very serious and important matter that we're dealing with today. Amen. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And this morning we have come to the, what I would consider to be the final portion of this letter that was penned by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of God Amen. to this relatively young church in the city of Colossae. Now we call it a city but it was a rather small city. Again, the Apostle Paul, when he penned this uh, letter, he was in Rome. He was under house arrest, and he had gotten a visit from one of his co-laborers by the name of Epaphras as he's sitting there in Rome under house arrest. Now, Epaphras is mentioned uh, three times in Scripture. Uh, he's mentioned in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 7. You can look back there and see his name. You can forward down to verse 12 and you find his name there again. And you find also his name in the book of Philemon in verse 23, who Philemon was the pastor at the church at Colossae, I believe. Epaphras was the man that Paul had left in Colossae, really in that region, to oversee the three churches that had been planted, likely by the church at Ephesus when Paul was there for three years, that were located in that Lycus Valley. Now, the Lycus Valley is a valley to the east of Ephesus, about 10 miles long. And there were three churches that I believe the church at Ephesus planted in that valley. And one was the church at Colossae. The other was the church at Hierapolis. And the other was a church at Laodicea. We read of that in, really in the book of Colossians and also in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ as well. Now, when Epaphras visited Paul, he told him of some good things that were happening there in the church of Colossae. He mentions those things in Colossians chapter 1 at the beginning. But he also told Paul of, of some concerning things that were happening in the church at Colossae as well. Now, the main thing that concerned Epaphras and would have concerned the apostle Paul was that there were some false teachers there that were influencing the thinking of the church at Colossae about the Lord Jesus Christ. They were spreading false philosophies and false doctrine. They were wrongly teaching a lot of things, but one of the things was they were wrongly teaching that Jesus Christ may have been sufficient for salvation, but for the Christian life, for day-to-day -day living, to deal with the problems of every day, he's not enough that you need more, that you need the help of men. You need the philosophies of men is what you need. By the way, that same type of thinking is prevalent today. 
Don't many Christians say, well, yes, I'm saved. I, they could tell you, I know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. They can give a date of their salvation. They can give a clear testimony of salvation. But they'll go on to say, well, preacher, though, for the problems that I have, I need something else. You know, my anxiety, my depression, my PTSD, my I have bipolar disorder. For those types of things, preacher, I need to go see somebody else. I need the psychologist. I, I need the psychiatrist. I need the therapist. And I need medication. I need the philosophies of men. That's what I need. I need the philosophies of Sigmund Freud and B.F. Skinner, and they think that I need more than Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to stick my neck out here, right here, nice and early this morning. You don't need any of that. Amen. You do not need it. Everything that you and I need Amen. for this life and beyond is found in Jesus Christ and his word. Amen. There it is. Everything. You see, when a person trusts Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, we are not only forgiven of all our sins, praise the Lord for that, and we're guaranteed a home in heaven when we leave this earth. There's more than that. But wait, there's more. The Holy Spirit of God indwells us, and we are given a new nature, and we are, an, we are enabled and empowered by the Spirit of God to live a victorious Christian life. And we can do it. We have everything we need in Jesus Christ. Don't let anyone convince you that you need anything else. You know, that's why Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. He said, uh, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of men, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. There it is. He's all that we need. And beginning in chapters 1 and 2, Paul begins to try to explain this to them. And he starts by reminding them of who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us. Amen. He reminds them that Jesus is God. Amen. That he is a creator. Right. That all things were made by him and it, by him all things consist. In other words, all things are held together. And he possesses all power. Uh, for two chapters he was explaining to them who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us. And then beginning in chapter 3, he begins to instruct them on how they and you and me as believers can realize the abundant Christian life that Jesus Christ promised without seeking the philosophies of men. Here's how we do it. And he starts by saying, well, first of all, set your affection on things above. Stop looking on earthly things. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Then in verse 5 of chapter 3, he tells them, here's another thing. Mortify the deeds of the flesh. In other words, put them to death, starve them, and he lists them, uh, some of them, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. Then in verses 8 through 12, he says, then you are to put off the old man and put on uh, the new man. That's what you are to do. And you may be sitting here this morning saying, Preacher, how do I do that? Well, go listen to the messages I preached before. No, no, no the, key, the key is found in verse 16. Here it is. He says to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. There it is. In other words, we must let the word of God dwell in us, which means we are to allow the word of God to take over as the owner of our lives. Amen. To dwell in us richly. To have complete control, complete authority over every area of our lives uh, to the point that the Word of God governs our life uh, and controls every aspect of our lives, not just at church, but every area at every time. Right. By the way, this is not achieved by a simple casual reading of the Word of God or simply a Sunday morning service, or even just three. It is achieved as you and I hear the Word of God, Amen. we heed the Word of God, we hide it in our hearts, and we handle it rightly. And then he goes on to show that when the Word of God is dwelling in us richly, it's going to affect every area of our lives. Amen. Wives will be submissive to their husbands. 
Husbands will love their wives as Christ loved the church. Children will obey their parents. Fathers will not provoke their children to wrath. Servants will obey their employers. And masters in chapter 4 and verse 1 will treat those under them justly and equal. Now, here we are. Paul is going to now deal with another ingredient that is absolutely necessary if you and I are going to live the abundant Christian life and produce the most fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. And that ingredient is prayer. Amen. Prayer. We as believers must be people Amen. of right. prayer. I'd like for us to notice the phrase found in verse 2, a simple three-word phrase. Continue in prayer. This morning I'd like to preach on that subject. I'll tell you, when I was putting this message together, I was telling my wife, I had about a two and a half hour message. When you start on prayer, there's so much to cover. I said, I got to chop this thing down somehow. Well, I managed to do that and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Right. This morning I want to preach on the subject, continue in prayer. Or here's a better title I like. The Christian's Most Unused and Misused Weapon. Amen. That's what it is. Yeah. You know, during the Civil War, one of uh, General Stonewall Jackson's, he was a devout Christian Sunday school teacher, one of his officers, his unsaved officers, came to him at night, and uh, he told him that some of the soldiers were, quote, here's how he put it, they're making a noise in their tent. And Jackson asked this offer, he said, what are they doing? He said, well, they're, they were first singing hymns and now they're praying. <laughs> Jackson replied, and is that a crime? The officer said, sir, the Articles of War orders punishment for any unusual noise. Uh, Jackson said, quote, God forbid that praying should be an unusual noise in the camp. But the truth of the matter is, for many Christians, prayer is an unusual noise. We don't pray as we ought to, uh, outside of praying for our meals, uh, or praying for the offering at church, or, or praying for a class, uh, or, or, or moments of prayer after our devotion. Not much more prayer is done than that, and statistics tell us that. I was reading an article written by Dr. Gary Linton, not sure exactly who he is, sound like a preacher, I'm not sure, but I'm not endorsing him, so don't go look him up. The article was entitled, Why Christians Don't Pray, February 2023. Linton writes this, quote, The average Christian spends, spends less than 10 minutes each day in prayer. Why don't we spend more time in prayer? Most of us believe in prayer, and I think that's true. We would all say, yes, I believe in prayer. It says, at least in theory. Then why is it that we find it so hard to actually pray? You see, if prayer is God's prescribed means of communicating with Him and fellowshipping with Him and get, getting Him, our God, to move on our behalf and on the behalf of others, why don't we pray more? Good. Why don't we? Right. I wonder that in my own life. Why don't I pray more? So this morning I want us to consider several things about continuing in prayer. Let's consider, number one, some principles of prayer. Let me lay a foundation here before we get into the text. You know, one of the most visited subjects in the letters of the Apostle Paul that he wrote to the churches was the subject of prayer. We see it again and again in his letters to the churches. Paul believed in prayer. Uh, he instructed us to pray and others to pray. He engaged in prayer. Some of his letters include prayer. And he often requested prayer. But uh, what exactly is prayer? And why should we do it? Well, prayer, simply put, is when a believer, when someone that knows the Lord Jesus Christ communicates with God. It's that simple. It's when you and I talk to God, when we have fellowship with our God, and we uh, take our needs to Him, and we take the needs of others to Him uh, as well. Uh, and we can do this, by the way, because of our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, shed His blood, Remember, the veil of the temple was rent. Uh, it opened access to the Holy of Holies. Uh, and so through the blood of Jesus Christ, I can come boldly to the throne of grace with my request to God because of his work on the cross of Calvary. We've all heard this saying, God speaks to us through prayer. We speak to God through prayer. 
I'm sorry, God speaks to us through his word, and we speak to God through prayer. And that's how it is. When we read the Bible, he's speaking to us. And when we bow our heads and pray, we are communicating with him. It's really, really simple. It's, it's when you and I bow our heads and we communicate, imagine this, to the one who created us, uh, uh, the one who saved us, the one who loves us, uh, the one who sustains us, uh, the one who controls all things. Uh, and, and imagine he desires to have fellowship with us. Isn't that an amazing thought? You know, I, I think of what the psalmist said. I would echo the same thing. When I consider thy heavens in Psalm 8, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? But yet beside all of that, our God, our creator, the God of all, the almighty God desires for you and us to pray to him, to have fellowship with him. Some people ask, okay, preacher, so I communicate with God. What do I pray? And why do I pray? Well, let's consider some principles about prayer. Number one, it's parts. Go over to Luke chapter 11. I'm trying to simplify this, and I think I am as much as possible. Go to Luke chapter 11. Now, notice what the disciples asked in Luke 11, 1. We read, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, excuse me, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, as many times I've been on visitation, sometimes after we lead someone to Christ and I ask them if they want to pray and ask the Lord to, say, to save them, or I talk to a new Christian about prayer, one of the questions they ask is, how do I pray? I mean, what do I do? What, what do I do? Do I just talk to God? A lot of times people are brought up in perhaps Roman Catholicism where you have these rote prayers, these memorized things that you say. Uh, that's not prayer at all. So what exactly is prayer? Notice, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Go down to verse 9. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. So here in Luke 11, the, the, the disciples had just seen the Lord Jesus Christ praying. And when he was finished, one of them said, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And notice the Lord gives to his disciples what we call the model prayer. Right. Now let me clarify here, because these are not words that we are to merely recite from rote memory. You go to one of your denominational churches, Protestant churches, they'll stand up and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be. I did that when I grew up Methodist. We did recite that. Uh, but the Lord cleared that up in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. He said this, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So what is this then if we're not to pay, uh, pray these words? Uh, well, what it is, it's actually, it's kind of an outline for our prayer time. It's a model of, uh, of uh, what our time communicating with God ought to look like. And so as we look through the Bible, we find as you and I go to God in prayer, there are essentially five components that we should include in our prayer time. We should all have a time of prayer with God. What should that include? Now let me just put a disclaimer here. There are times throughout the day that we simply pray certain, for certain specific things. We have our prayer chain here, and uh, of course we get uh, that notices of folks, hey, pray for this person, and so we take a moment and, and we, we pray for that person. Amen. Sometimes we, of course, do pray for a trip that we're going on. We'll pray for our food. Those are all right things. We'll pray for the offering, as we did earlier. We pray for the service. We, we pray sometimes for an urgent need throughout the day. And so, yes, those are times that are important to pray, but there should also be a set time each day that you and I... I should stop and spend time in prayer with God. That's according to the Bible. Psalm 5 and verse 3. My voice shall thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. 
Psalm 55 and verse 17. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. And so when we were thinking about those times that you and I set aside, whether it be in the morning, whether it be at night, whatever it may be, that you and I set aside for prayer, I believe we find five components that should be a part of our prayer time. Here they are. Going to go through them real quick. I'm, I'm heading somewhere else. Number one is this, adoration. In other words, there should be a time when you and I worship God, right. our Father which art in heaven. You are God. We're worshiping Him. In other words, we take a moment to recognize God for who He is. Listen, we're fellowshipping with God. We're not just going in with a laundry list and saying, okay, God, here I am. Give me this, 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 this. In Jesus' name, amen, here I go. No, it's time. Uh, it begins with adoration. And then number two, the second component is confession. So we should spend a time worshiping God and then also have a time where you and I confess our sins like David did in Psalm 51, naming our sins and saying the same thing about our sins that God says that they're wrong and wicked and evil and asking forgiveness for it. And that's what the model prayer says as well. And forgive us our sins. Right. Then there's thirdly should be a time of petition. Right. So there's a time of adoration. There's a time of confession. Then there's a time of Petition. Petition is when you and I pray for our own personal needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, this is what I need today. Would you please bless and guide and direct and provide for me physically these things and so forth. That is number three. Number four would be intercession. Intercession is when we pray for the needs of others. When we have our lists of people and the so forth and the, the people that are sick and that sort of thing, and we pray for their needs. And then number five is thanksgiving. Amen. There should be a time where we express our thanks for what he has done for us. Uh, again, these are the components of that time that you and I stop, uh, set time aside, and pray. We, it's a time of adoration, a time of confession, a time of petition, a time of intercession, and a time Amen. of thanksgiving. Right. Now, perhaps the most uh, earth-shattering, if you don't mind me putting it that way, earth-moving or dynamic components of all of those, I would say, are our intercessions. And, and really, that's what Paul, when we go back to Colossians chapter 4, that's what he's asking them for. Continue and pray. We're in verse 3, we'll get to this later, with all praying for us. He's saying, pray for us, intercede for us. Uh, uh, that's what he's referring to here. So again, our prayer, those are the components of our times in prayer, and part of that is intercession. The parts of prayer are components. And I want us to consider, number two, the consequences of prayer. So why do we do these things? Why, why do we spend time in, in adoration and confession and then ask God for things and then intercede on the behalf of others? Why should we pray? Here's why. Because prayer changes things. Amen. It does. Amen. It absolutely changes things. You see, prayer is the means, and I'm talking specifically here now about our petitions and intercessions. Uh, uh, prayer is the means that God has given to believers to move him to action. Praise the Lord. Imagine, we can move God by our prayers. I could get in all the requirements of all that. That'll, that that's where the two-hour message was coming. But no, I'm not going to do that today. But understand, that's what it does. Now, let me show you a few things. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Because we see throughout the Bible that the prayer of God's people Amen. caused God to move, caused situations and things to be changed. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse Notice the situation that Paul is in. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Amen who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us, Amen. ye also helping together by Praise prayer God. for us. Amen. Prayer for us. In other words, they prayed for him, for Paul, the church at Corinth, and God changed that situation. He changed it. Amen. Now we find that in many places. Go over to Hebrews chapter 13. 
I could give us probably at least half a dozen of these examples. Let me just give you a couple here. Hebrews chapter 13. Paul believed it, that prayer would change things. Look at verse 18. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly, but I beseech you the rather to do this, pray for them, that I may be restored to you the sooner. In other words, if you pray, God may answer that prayer and restore me to you the sooner. Now think in your mind for a moment through the Old Testament and the prayer of God's people and how those prayers moved God to change things. Amen. For example, King Hezekiah. Won't, right. won't spoil it because I'm preaching on Hezekiah Sunday night. But if you remember, he, he, was, he moved God. His prayer moved God to add 15 years to his life. God changed it. I think of Moses. We could go back to Numbers chapter 11. You don't have to go there, uh, but uh, we read, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. Amen. Over and over in the ministry of Moses in the Old Testament, we find him praying to God and God changing that situation. Numbers 21 and verse 5 is the same, uh, same thing. When they were complaining and they were dying of the plague, Moses intercedes for them and God changes that situation. I wonder this morning, do we believe that God can do that? You know, I truly believe that our prayers for Jack Walton is a reason that he is where he is today. I just believe that. I was amazed when I went up to see Mary and uh, uh, she had said that, uh, you know, he really had a turnaround about 6 o'clock on, on, uh, uh, on a Sunday night. And we had opened the service up and we all prayed for him. And she said it just seemed to turn right about then. I, I think the same of Burton Betts. I think it's our prayers that, that change things there as well. Uh, he was likely on his way to heaven, but God answered our prayers. Understand something. Our God, our prayers can move God to change things. He can heal someone through our prayers. He can extend their life through our prayers. He can deliver them from a situation through our prayers. He can give people wisdom, give them protection. I believe he can show our nation mercy if we simply prayed. My point is this. Our prayers are not in vain. Prayer works. So do we believe it? Do we pray like we believe it? That's convicting to me. It surely is. So we see that some principles of prayer. Uh, number two, let's go back to our text and let's look at some particulars of prayer. Now notice what Paul does here. He, he, he tells them some particular things about prayer that are very important to keep in mind as we pray. Again, he's talking here primarily about intercessions, praying for other people, praying that God would change situations in people's lives. And notice he says in Colossians chapter 2 and ver, uh, chapter 4 and verse 2, he says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Amen. So Paul is trying to encourage them from the prison in Rome. He's trying to encourage these young Christians to not give up on praying, to keep on praying. And he gives them some particulars. And I want to deal with these three words real quick that Paul uses as he instructs them to pray. He uses the word continue. He uses the word watch. And he uses the phrase with thanksgiving. Those are very important things to remember when you and I pray. Continue, watch, with thanksgiving. Amen. Now, why is that important? Well, I, I see what those three words really tell us about prayer. I see continue. The word continue gives us, if you don't mind me putting it this way, the always of prayer. Amen. The always. Amen. In other words, he's saying continue in prayer. That word continue means this, to be constantly at it. It means to persevere. It means to be diligent about it. In other words, what he's saying to them, listen, whatever you do, don't stop praying. Amen. You see, praying ought to be the great habit of the life of every Christian. Right. 
We, ought to, we all ought to be characterized by praying. Again and again in the Bible, we are told to keep on praying. Jesus Christ told his disciples in Luke chapter 18 and verse 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray, notice, and not to faint. He says, keep on praying. The Lord Jesus is telling us, don't faint, don't give up. Romans 12, 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulations, continuing instant in prayer. Amen. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Now, why are we told that? I, I, I mean, once is enough in the Word of God. But over and over, Christ says, uh, to, listen, you need to pray. Don't faint. That's good. Uh, Paul tells the, the believers at Rome, be constant. Don't stop. The church at Ephesus, pray always. Thessalonica, pray with that. Why is that? Why, why does he tell us, keep praying, don't quit, don't give up? I'll tell you why. Because there's a tendency in all of us to quit. Right. Amen. There's a tendency in all of us to lighten up in our prayer life. That's why this message is so important. Amen. You know, commentator John Phillips wrote this. He said, quote, The great resource available to every believer is prayer. Prayer is what links us with God's throne. Amen. It is by prayer that we do business in the heavenlies. It is the most purely spiritual of all of our exercises, yet there is nothing that we neglect more. Most people would rather do anything than pray. Why is that? Because prayer, praying is labor. It's work. It is tedious. It is time consuming. And it requires much spiritual discipline. And our flesh would rather do anything else than do that. I'd rather work, work and work and work and work, work, work my head off for two hours than pray for two hours. I think most of us would say that if we had a preference that I, 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 I can work. William Graham Scroggie, his book in Method on Prayer, he wrote this. One of the greatest mistakes that a Christian can make is to imagine that increased activity can be any compensation for the lack of secret communion with God. In other words, we can't substitute activity for our prayer life, for our communion with God. He says a prayerful life is always a powerful life, and a prayerless life is always a powerless life. If we cannot pray aright, we, can, we really can do nothing aright. Uh, uh, but how slow we are to believe that. The more we pray, the more we realize we need to and want to, and the less we pray, the less we desire to do so. Right. It's a powerful statement. Amen. You see, there are great enemies of prayer right. in our flesh that we must fight. One is this, drowsiness. We're so, we're so, all these time-saving sa devices we have on our cell phones and all that has done nothing more than crowd our lives with a bunch of junk. Amen. And we're busy, 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 one thing after the other. And when it comes time for us to sit down and listen to a sermon or bow our heads in prayer, many of us have to fight dozing off. And some of you failed this morning. They don't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> but we have to fight that. We have to fight distractions. Distractions of our own mind. I mean, I bow my head to pray and I start praying for things. You know what that does? It reminds me of all the things I have to do because I'm praying for them. And I say, I better get through this. I got to get started, you know. But I have to stop and say, no, I have to not be distracted. Uh, we, uh, the enemy of substitution, as I said a moment ago, working instead of praying. And then the, the enemy of discouragement, uh, that we prayed and prayed and prayed for certain things and we didn't see the answer that we want. And so we stopped praying because we're discouraged. But I want to encourage us all this morning, as the Apostle Paul is doing to this church at Colossae, keep on praying. Amen. Continue in praying. Uh, per, uh, have you ever thought that perhaps a poor nation, a poor condition of our nation and our churches and the families in our churches and marriages and children and the lack of laborers is in part the result of either a weak or a mechanical or a non-existent prayer life? Right. That's good. Amen. Maybe it is. Amen. James 4.2 says what? We uh, have not because we Amen. ask not. 
So continue, he says. That talks about the always of prayer. Then notice he says to watch. That has to do with the alertness of prayer. Amen. He says continue in prayer and watch. Amen. Watch? What do you mean watch? What does that mean? You know, it's interesting that six times in the New Testament we find those two words linked together. Watch and pray. Amen. Watch and pray. Right. Jesus said it in Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Uh, Mark 14, 38. Watch ye and pray. Same thing. Lest ye enter into temptation. Uh, uh, Luke 21, 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. Colossians 4, 2. Continue in prayer and watch. Just read it our text. 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. He says uh, pray and watch. Watch and pray. What does that mean? Why, is it, why does he say that? Why does he link watching and praying? I'll tell you why. Because the one has a dynamic effect on the other. My watching and my prayer. Here's what I mean. How I watch, how you watch, will affect how we pray. Amen. You see, the word watch is from the Greek word Gregoria. Anybody named Gregory in here? We're going to watch you. Yeah, there we go. Okay. That's, that's where we get the name Gregory. It means this, watch it, to be alert. Amen. But not just alert to nothing. In the context of the Bible, it means to be spiritually awake. Amen. To be, have eyes, spiritual eyes, to see what's going on in this world, to pay attention, uh, to know the times, uh, to be mindful of things spiritually. Amen. You know, as believers, we can either mind the things of the Spirit or we can mind the things of the flesh. We can be watching, you know, things that don't mean anything temporally or we can be mindful to the things of God. And there's a warning for all of us that we need to be aware of what's going on in this world and the times that we're living in because when we watch, guess what? We will pray. That's what's going to prompt us to do. Look over Romans chapter 13 real quick. Romans 13 and verse 11. Here's an admonition to all of us to wake up spiritually. Amen. Familiar passage. And that, chapter 13, verse 11, and that knowing the time, right. that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wanting, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Amen. You see, when you and I are alert to, to spiritual things, when our spiritual eyes are open, when we see life as God wants us to see it, we will realize the fact that life is short and Christ is coming at any moment and souls are in the brink and laborers are needed for the harvest and the great need of our nation is revival. We'll understand there is an urgency to the hour that we live in. And when we're alert to those things, Amen. it's going to have a profound effect on how we pray. Right. Amen. Be more than, Lord, I pray that my son will win the ball game today. Right. I pray he doesn't break a finger. Maybe the wrong things are on your mind or the priorities are wrong. Amen. So we'll be praying for the right thing, the alertness of prayer. And then notice he says with thanksgiving, that has to do with the attitude of prayer. So here it is, I, I'm to continue in prayer. I'm to be alert to what's going on around me. And he says, do it with thanksgiving. Why would he say that? Because I need to be thankful however God chooses to answer my prayers. Amen. Knowing that he, he knows what he's doing. Amen. See, it's easy to get discouraged. Right. I, like you, I pray for our nation. I do. I pray for our, 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 our president. That's a little bit. <coughs> Sorry. I, I pray for him. Amen. No, I do. I pray. We do in, in church and so forth. Amen. And, and, and we, want, we want revival. We want to see Amen. things change. And it almost Amen. seems like they're not. And I know I understand where the world's going. I know what the Bible says. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. But I'm praying God gives us a little bit of a revival before all Amen. that takes place. 
and we don't see it happen, guess what can happen? We can get discouraged. And so he says, look, you continue in prayer. Be alert to what's going on. But be thankful knowing that I'm in control of this thing and you may be willing to, and you need to be willing to take yes as an answer or no as an answer or wait as an answer. Because sometimes God says, no, I'm not doing that. Amen. We're not to get mad. Right. We're to get, be thankful for it, knowing that he knows better than I do. Amen. So I see, number one, again, the principles of prayer. I see, number two, the particulars of prayer uh, uh, to, to continue and to watch and to be thankful. Amen. But then number three, the priority of prayer. So Amen. after Paul tells them to continue and watch, notice he, he tells them what to pray for. He asks them to pray for him. With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance, Amen. to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Amen. Do you know, usually we, what we ask people to pr pray for is what we feel is important to us. Right. I'm going to ask you to pray for something if it's important to me if it's a priority in my life, if it's something I place up high on the priority list of my life. Uh, but notice, uh, before we look at what Paul asked him to pray for, stop for a moment and notice what he didn't ask him to pray for. He didn't ask him to pray for his circumstances. He didn't say, not that it would be wrong to do that. I'm talking about priorities now. What's more important? He didn't say, you know, pray that I get out of this place. Pray that the food gets better. Pray that I get a nicer guard. He didn't say any of that. Amen. He didn't ask him to pray for his eye infirmity, which he never got rid of. Hey, could you, what, his infirmity of the flesh, I think it was an eye infirmity. He didn't ask him to pray for that. Uh, he didn't ask uh, uh, that he'd be treated. None of that stuff. Uh, he didn't ask to pray for his health. Uh, uh, he, he didn't pray for any of that. Uh, he prayed for the spiritual needs of others. Amen. Not the physical needs. Right. Yeah. Now again, there's nothing wrong, and the Bible does tell us to pray for healing. It tells us to pray for anything, really. But really, how we see things will be evident in what we ask as a priority of our prayer requests. Amen. You know, you go to the average church, Baptist church today, and the prayer meeting, and look at the prayer list, I'm just saying this is the way it is. I'm not trying to be mean or ugly. But 90, probably, and I'm just arbitrarily grabbing a percentage here, but probably about 95% of it is about people's physical needs. Pray for this. Pray for this person. This person I don't know is having a surgery. This person here. And I wonder sometimes, maybe we should add to that, pray for the surgery, but also that this person gets saved. I mean, we've had people ask, pray for this person and for their surgery, and, and we say, well, are they saved? Well, I, I don't know. Amen. Well, shouldn't that be our priority? Amen. Isn't that why God brings things many times into right. people's lives? Amen. Why does he need to put them in the hospital? Why do they need to help them to realize, hey, life is short. This body's given up. I'm going to die one day. And they start thinking about spiritual things, and we should pray more for their soul than we should for their circumstances. That's what Paul said. There's a priority there. Amen. You see, when we have the right priorities right. in our prayer Amen. life, I think we'll see the, 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 the results that God wants us to see Amen. from our prayers. He prayed for the Spirit. Notice again what he says. Pray for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance Amen. to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest. Uh, he's saying, pray, pray that I give out the gospel. Pray that God gives me opportunities. Uh, uh, pray that the, these folks, their hearts are open. Pray for the souls of men. Uh, you know, uh, uh, that's, that's the, one of the most important prayers that you and I can bring to the throne of grace. Amen. And I wonder sometimes, maybe if we understood prayer a little better, and the priorities we should have in prayer. Amen. And the time we should spend in prayer. Right. And the way we ought to pray. Amen. If maybe things would be different. Right. Maybe things would be different. Paul says continue in prayer. Amen. Years ago I preached a message about the lost acts. It was, you know, with Elijah and, Elijah and all that. And uh, the, the, the premise of it was, you know, sharpen your acts. We've all heard that. The idea was to... Uh, 
you know, you can take an axe and use it and use it and use it and use it, but there comes a time you got to stop and sharpen that axe. And sharpening that axe is not a waste of time. Sharpening that axe is important so you become more fruitful. While you're sharpening that axe, you may be sitting there thinking, you know, I could be doing all this tree cutting here and it's not getting done. Well, you're going to do a lot more tree cutting if you go ahead and sharpen your axe. And I related that to the idea of you and I. It is not a waste of time to, to stop and spend time with God every single day. It makes us more productive. Spend time in his word. Come to him in prayer. Spend time there so that you and I could be more productive for him and be more fruitful in this world. Through prayer. I think it was the next week, Brother Jack Walton. He came to me in the church and he, he brought this to me, this big old axe from a barn. I guess, I don't know if they tore it down. You know, Jack, he has all kinds of stuff, little memorabilia things. And he brought it into church about this big. He said, here, that's for you. And I took that axe, and to this day, it's sitting in my office at home. So when I get up every morning, instead of me rushing into the day, because every, every one of us is busy, no matter whether you're a pastor, you've got a family, all of us are busy. It reminds me every day when I look on that wall, I need to stop and spend time with God Continue Amen. in prayer because I know prayer changes things. Amen. The question is, do you and I believe it? And not just with a nod of our head, but by the evidence of our prayer life. Imagine the difference all of us could make in this world if we committed to a time of prayer every day in the presence of God for our nation, for our families, for our churches, Imagine the difference we could make. Amen. Prayer is so, so important. Amen.